than when I was originally planned to come and be with you. And that um, a lot of my notes just don't fit anymore. And I started, and I also, uh, because I'm a nervous speaker, I've got all these notes and you're going to see me looking down and you're going to know that's because I'm looking at my notes. In, in the original um, presentation, I start out with talking about CAP scores. And it's like, as I'm reading that at six o'clock this morning, I thought, who cares about CAP scores anymore? You know, it just seemed so trivial when you look at where everyone is today, that we used to be really worried about our scores. And now what we're worried about is how are we going to connect with our families? How are we going to provide end of life care that meets the needs uh, of families and of patients? When are involves touching, involves being up close and personal. Um, that's part of how we create bonding for relief. And that major tool that we have has been taken away from us. You know, now we're doing what we're doing right now is you're looking at my face on, on a computer screen and how am I going to get um, bonding with you uh, with this cold um, technical um, tool that we're now forced to use? And even, and, and I, I'll come back to some questions, but even when you're doing a home visit, you've got a mask on, you've got gloves on, I don't know if you've got gowns, how much protective gear, but you've got some. And that um, takes away from the personalness, if I made up a word here, uh, of what we're trying to create. It is a distancing factor between us and connecting with our patient. And so these are new challenges that we're going to have to figure out because a huge part of our work uh, starts with bonding, starts with bonding. So a couple of questions that I wanna ask. So anyone out there that can answer them, this'll help me with the rest of, of our talking today. Are you doing face-to-face um, -face home visits at this point, or is all or most of it done via Zoom and the phone? Can Barbara, I'm just waiting for a couple answers to come in. I'm keeping okay. an eye out. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm going to put Marjorie on the line. Hi. Hi, Marjorie. Uh, um, we are, we're doing essential visits is, is what we're making those face to face. Um, other visits we're doing um, uh, virtually or by phone. Um, we're staying out of most assisted living facilities and nursing homes. Um, they don't want us to come in right now and we want to respect their boundaries and and keep everybody safe so that's what it looks like right now okay um, and when are you when do you what's your average time are you getting patients weeks before death days before death kind of on an average what what is that time frame how much time do you have to work with the family um i don't know who can answer that 
I've got um, a couple more hands raised. Hang on. <laughs> Let's okay. see. We have Lindsay here. Hi. Hi. Um, portion. Um, so our patients are typically three to five days maximum. Um, and lately, a lot of our patients have been 24 to 48 hours. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense of uh, yeah. that, I know it's different than the home program, but that's the, the Gosnell kind of time frame. And does anyone know about home? Have you got weeks? Uh, you know, most, most hospices at this point are doing good if they've got a week to work with a family versus day. An hour. This is Kara. Um, I can answer to the home. Um, it varies widely. It can be um, days, weeks, or still, um, you know, obviously we've only been in this a couple of months, but we still do have some longer term patients on service with us. But, um, the, you know, days to weeks. Days to weeks. Okay. Thank you so much. This, this will help me as I go on talking. Okay. Taking care of someone at end of life is different than taking care of someone who's going to get better. Um, we know that, but our families don't, most people don't know that. And so most people, um, because they don't know the difference, our work is judged by on how people get better, unless we teach them otherwise. And so that's why I say that 90% of our work is education. Because when we go in there, families don't have any clue on what dying, normal dying is about or what it looks like. All they've got is television and the movies and people don't die like that. Um, and so it's up to us to teach the family uh, how you take care of someone at end of life. And um, that's where we start, is um, teaching them the difference. And now that we've got all these handicaps that we didn't used to have, uh, it makes our work all the harder. So what I'm going to do this morning when I started going over these notes, I thought this is a whole different world. And so I'm, I'm making this up as I go along. So, so bear with me. First, we have, okay, I will say to you that I've been the director of a couple of different hospices and all of my work from Gone From My Sight to all the rest of the books, to the DVDs, the, the presentations that I used to give, um, all of that is geared um, from my perspective as a director. It's how I would, what I would use if I had my own hospice today. And so that's where, where all, of, all of these materials come from, is in my, inside my head and what I would do if I were running an agency. And knowing that education is the key component in providing care. Um, so you start with your staff and you want to make sure that the entire staff is all on the same page because um, anymore we study from different courses, different books, and we've also gotten to the place where we hospice has gotten so much bigger that oftentimes we're hiring because we need nurses not based on their skills but on our needs. And so how we educate our staff is the key so that you provide continuity of care so that everyone is teaching the same thing. So now, this is how people die. It's a three hour DVD 
I put it in three parts because most of us don't have three hours to sit there and watch it. Um, so you do in services. In this day and age, you can Vimeo it, you can share it via um, tele, tele whatever you want to call it. I used to give workshops. I gave this workshop around the country. And um, in doing so, it teaches basic end of life care and just the knowledge of how people die. There are only two ways to die, gradual or fast. It addresses that because gradual death has a process to it. If it didn't have a process, it would be fast death. So gradual death and its process is our foundation when we work with end of life, okay? So this, you use it for your new staff orientation. You, in service, everyone in your agency, receptionists, volunteers, you also figure out how to in service your nursing facilities. Now, this sounds all great and wonderful, but today we're dealing with an emergency situation. Um, so you're not gonna have time to be doing a lot of in services, but when you do, you wanna think about this. The other thing about running an agency is that we have to take care of our staff. And the, st the thing with staff is, we're kind of like salmon swimming upstream. We're going against the current of what the modern health medical model is. Um, the medical model is that death is a failure. Um, it's the enemy. And we're kind of on the outskirts of this medical model. And we're saying, no, wait a minute everybody dies um, and there's a natural normal way that that happens and our job being on the outskirts of this medical model is to teach families and the community um, that there is a normal natural way that people die all right the problem is that because we're salmon, um, we're kind of feeling on the outskirts and it makes our work and keeping ourselves healthy harder. Now add the pandemic and that makes it even worse. So taking care of yourself becomes paramount. I like to say you got to put your oxygen mask on first before you can help others. And as an agency, you've got to make sure your staff has the oxygen mask on so that they can go out and provide the care. Some of the key um, things that I think are important in staff taking care of yourself and become even more important today is that I think every person out there needs a buddy system. I learned early, early on, I'd come home and I, you know, have had something happen during the day and I'd start telling my husband, oh, this happened and that happened. And after a few days of this, he said, Barbara, you can't tell me this stuff. I can't deal with it. I needed to download, but at the same time, I had to find someone that I could download with that I wasn't hurting them and upsetting them, but also someone that could support me. And so I strongly encourage every one of you who are working in end of life that you find a listener, find someone that you can relate to and talk to, that you can get in your car and drive around the corner and stop and call your buddy and say, oh my God, you wouldn't believe what just happened. 
and get it out. Because if you don't get it out, then you will carry it and it will build up and up and up. You know, I got into this work because I thought I had something to offer. I thought I had a good, strong belief system um, in what happens when someone dies. And so that first year that I worked, I went from, you know, a death in the morning, in the afternoon, I bring on two new patients and I just kept going and going. And about a year later, I was one of the facilitators of a brief workshop. And I'm the one that fell in a little heap on the floor and started crying and saying, there are so many ghosts. I was just taking all those people that, that had touched my life, uh, and every patient does touch our life, whether we acknowledge it or not. And I took all those memories and just kept stuffing them in a pocket. That day, I realized that I needed to develop closure for every single patient and family that I worked with. For me, my closure was going to the visitation. Went on my own dime, on my own time, but I went to a visitation. I didn't go to the funerals. Funerals are sitting there listening. Visitations are called visitations because you're visiting, you're interacting. And although you can't do that today, in a minute, I'm going to talk about rituals, but I would go up and put my hand on the patient, the person in the coffin, and say, thank you. Thank you for coming into my life. And I wish you well on your journey. And then I would go talk to the family and say, thank you for coming into my life. And I wish you well. That was my closure. That worked for me. It doesn't really work today because they're not having visitations, but I'm saying to you, find a ritual. Whether it's going home and having uh, lighting a candle and saying, I bless you, John Smith, and thank you for coming in my life and blow the candle out and with it know that you're wishing him on his way and you're releasing him from you. Or maybe you get a flower and put it in a vase uh, in a special place or you make a journal. You know, whatever works for you, but find some way of closure because that will keep you healthy and that will keep you in this work. And if you don't take care of yourself in this work, well, you're going to be selling dresses in five years. You won't be able to stay. All right. So I think those two items for staff are very, very important. Um, also, and I'll just say this what your belief system is regarding death, regarding dying, regarding after death. That's your foundation and you need to know what that is. Our work is not to go in there and tell others what our belief system is. We're to meet them where they are. But we need to know in the depths of ourselves what our belief system is. Um, because that confronting death every day, if you don't have a solid foundation in that, in what death is all about, again, you won't be able to stay in this work. All right, I've got all these notes down here. So when you see me looking down, uh, you'll know um, what that is, okay? This time with nursing facilities, they're a challenge and actually a whole workshop in themselves in, in trying to figure out how we can provide the best care. Um, I will say to you that those nursing facilities that won't let you in, 
then your key responsibility, if you take that person on service, becomes the family. And actually, when you have an average um, length of stay of weeks and days, then really your focus is on the family. It's not on the person that's dying. If pain isn't an issue, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, if pain isn't an issue, well, that person is so removed from their physical body, they're in the labor of dying, there isn't a lot you can do for them. You know, they're not eating, they're sleeping all the time. You put in a Foley catheter uh, and you keep their skin massage and keep them comfortable. That's what you're doing for the patient. Um, our best work for the patient is in the months before death, not when they're in labor, which is weeks to days before death. But our families, that's who we concentrate, help them have a sacred experience so that they will then have a sacred memory. All right. And the biggest part of that is to give them support and to neutralize the fear that they're bringing to this end of life experience. Because as I said earlier, we're looking at movies and the television. So we have to teach the families what the normal, natural way is that people die. Our body is made to die. We are born. I have to get a drink. Wait a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. We are born. <coughs> we experience and we die. It's the name of the game. And the body was made to die. How we take care of people who are dying has changed over eons of time. How the body dies has never changed. Just how we take care of it and how we deal with it. So we're going to educate the family in how end of life is different than taking care of someone who's going to get better. That's, that's, and it's the family that we're going to put our energies into. All right. As I, I have a stack over here of my booklets that I'm holding up. I forgot to do this. I have a booklet along with a DVD on how to take care of yourself. Um, it's short. It's just like all the other booklets. Uh, but this is for caregivers who work with end of life because we have different challenges, we have different needs, we grieve differently. And I thought I didn't grieve for my patients. You do, you do for every single one of them. You just aren't aware of it. Okay, so I have this. All right, now let's go. Gone from my side. There is, I don't have to say a lot about gone from my side because you use it. And I heard that you put it in your initial family packet. What I'm going to suggest, because you're not as close to your families as you normally would be. Normally, you could sit down on the sofa and the two of you read it, or three of it, you, however many, could read it together and talk about it. That's not going to happen now. So what you're going to do is, number one, you're going to put it in your care plan that you're going to go over with the family gone from my sight. Because this explains the gradual way a person dies. The normal, natural, I almost said healthy, and yet, and way that a person dies. I love it. It is healthy. It is a healthy way to die. And we're going to teach our families um, how that is. So since you all know this, you're going to put it in the care plan, you're going to call them on the phone, or you're going to do exactly what we're doing today. And we're going to say, get out your book. And now I want you to go to page eight. And let's read page eight together. And 
tell me if dad is at any of this place. What do you see in relationship to dad? So that your caregiver and your guide becomes your eyes to what's happening with this patient, okay? Remind me at some point to talk about how we can use volunteers in, in this new arena that we're dealing with. Okay, so um, I thought you might like to hear how a lot of people ask, why did you write this? How did that happen? How did that come about? Well, I was on call one night, two, three o'clock in the morning, family called, they were scared. And so I went to the home. If, if family's scared and you don't go, you're gonna wake up with them in the emergency room in the morning. So you roll out of bed and I'm sitting with the family um, in the living room, mom's in the bedroom, and I'm explaining to them what is happening. You know, what, what mom is experiencing, what the normal process is. One of the daughters was taking notes and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, she shouldn't have to take notes for goodness sake. And so I went home that weekend and I sat down and I wrote out on, before computers on a legal pad, I wrote out what uh, I wanted families to know about end of life and the dying process. And that's how and where gone from my, how it got here. All right, the other booklet that is a companion to, to Gone From My Sight is the 11th hour. Our goal when I was a hospice nurse, our goal was to be with the family at the moment of death. That was what we worked toward, was to be there to help support and guide that family through this very scary, scary time because we don't understand death. We don't have any role models. We bring to the bedside all of our fair fears and misconceptions. And as hospice has changed, as hospice has gotten bigger, I don't know what your hospice does, but I know more and more hospices are not with their families uh, at the moment of death. And so I thought, no, these families need guidance because as much as you can talk to them in the time, the days to weeks before death, and it's getting shorter and shorter, as much as we can talk to them, they're not gonna remember. That's why education isn't just verbal. You've got to hit different levels to educate. So you educate verbally and you educate visually. It reinforces, doesn't take the place of, but reinforces everything that you're teaching. So 11th hour goes into the initial family packet also. And you put it in the care plan that you're going to talk with the family about both of these booklets. And then you're going to document, because if you don't document, it didn't happen. You're going to document the conversation, what you taught and how they responded. All right. So re really important. I got to do this again. Sorry. Um, so these two are really important and this, what, what I have found, unfortunately, is that we put these two books in the initial family packet and then people don't read it. In that initial family packet are so many papers, they're overwhelmed, they don't read it until later and often it's too late. And so if you put it in the care plan that you have for this family, then you're going to get them to pull it out 
and you're going to talk about it and you're going to know that your education has been in place. Okay, so that's the 11th hour. Pain. I get letters all the time. I mean, weekly, I almost said daily, but let's say weekly on hospice killed my mom. They came in, they gave her morphine and three hours later, two hours, one hour later, she was dead. They killed her. With the opioid crisis, families are absolutely terrified of not just the word narcotics, but morphine, morphine. Oh, terrified, terrified, terrified. So I gave a workshop for um, WellSky, Chip, and it was on pain at end of life. And uh, at the end of the workshop, the webinar, podcast, whatever you want to call it, I opened it up for questions and he sent me 30 questions that came as the result of this hour webinar on pain at the end of life. And I was really, really surprised because the questions were all from healthcare providers and they were about basic, basic questions that they should have known, that they should know. So I took the outline of that I used for the webinar and I wrote this book. The key thing that most, even hospice caregivers don't know is that dying is not painful. Disease causes pain. The norm, you know, there's a lot of diseases out there that are very, very painful. And if a person has a diseased history of pain, then you're going to treat that pain up until their very last breath with however much it takes. And as a person is approaching death, the closer they get to death, then the crazier their body gets. Nothing works right. And so you're going to have to adjust and give more generally narcotic than you will in the months before death because the circulation isn't working right. Nothing works right. And so if, if this is the thing, if pain is part of the disease process, then you treat that pain till their last breath. But there's a lot of diseases that have no pain at all. So when you're looking at the disease history, if there's no pain in the disease history, then just because they're dying doesn't mean that it's now painful. We, the watchers, look at the body and what it's doing, and we interpret that as being painful. When in essence, really look at the little chicken that is trying to get out of its shell and it's poking and it's working really, really hard. So it is when we're trying to get out of our body. We work really, really hard. And the body feels tired. It feels heavy. It's ache all over like if you have the flu. Now, if you've got the flu, you're not going to take morphine. You're going to take a couple ibuprofen. So it is, if you think a person is uncomfortable as you look beyond and deeper into the labor signs, then give them some ibuprofen. You don't have to give them morphine just because it looks like they're in pain. Check further. So I wrote this, if pain is part of the disease history, you put it in the initial family packet so that the family's got this and they understand. And you will neutralize a lot of the fear that that family is bringing to the bedside in regards to pain management. 
And one of the things, I'll just toss this out, when I, I say to a family who writes me a letter and says, hospice came in, mom was doing fine, they gave her morphine, and an hour later she was dead, I tell them that the morphine did not kill her because it's probably still sitting in her under her tongue or in her rectum, or you don't have to give needles uh, uh, at end of life, but the, the circulation was so bad and shutting down at that point that that morphine didn't go anywhere. All right, so morphine didn't kill her. She'd have died whether she had it or not. All right, so initial family packet, put it in your, um, your care plan also so that you talk to the family 90 percent of our work education education how am i doing all right it's I, i've still got time all right how how do i know you hospice is taking on more and more people um with dementia now, I've got a whole soapbox about dementia because I think that for dementia doesn't play by the rules for approaching death. The only way you're going to know someone who has dementia with no other um, life threatening illness, uh, the only way you're going to know that they've entered the dying process is when they can't eat when they hold the food in their mouth, when they start choking, when they can't swallow. If you don't eat, you don't live. And then they're appropriate for hospice. I don't know what your policy is about dementia at end of life. I know it's a great money maker, but you have to be really, really careful because it ends up, you bring them on and six months later, you have to take them off and the family's really, really upset with you. Um, what I see is that there's this huge void in our healthcare system that does not address the needs that families with someone that has dementia have. And hospice has stepped into that void to address this overwhelming need of families out there that are caregivers are dying before the patient dies because we're wearing them out. We're not taking care of them. And hospice has stepped in to fill that void. But generally, unless they're not eating and decide not to have a feeding tube, then they're generally not appropriate for hospice. But I wrote a booklet, whoops, for this very reason, so that families will understand where their loved one is, they'll understand that dementia doesn't play by the rules, and it addresses the um, pre-grieving and the many, many losses that families have um, when they have a loved one that has dementia. Okay. Um, a time to live. This is probably my least known of the booklets. And it's one of my favorites. Now, maybe it's one of my favorites because I wrote it for my mother and stepfather. It is for the patient with a life-threatening illness from new diagnosis, palliative care, as long as they have energy to read, it's for the patient. Both of my parents were diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, same thing, cancer of the lung, both of them smokers, um, and they died within five months of each other. And I was the director of a hospice at that time, and I wanted, there was so much I wanted to say to them. Stepfather wouldn't have any of it. Boy, the doctors said that your daughter is, um, is the, all she's interested is death and don't listen to her. That was her on, his oncologist. And so he listened to his doctors and he uh, died five months after he was diagnosed having had radiation and chemotherapy and, and an awful five months. My mother, listened to me 
And I said, don't do anything. Just let's live the best you can within the confines that this disease has put you in. But, you know, treatment's not going to help. And she listened. And she lived 18 months. And most of that, except for probably the last month, was really pretty good. Now she had to attend her husband's funeral. And it was, think about how that is with a woman at the coffin of her husband who died from exactly what she's got and knowing that she was going to be there not too long from that. Anyway, I wrote this on how to live. All right, then I've got, and I don't have it. So I wrote this so I wouldn't forget. It is a yellow booklet called My Friend I Care. And My Friend I Care, um, I used to get letters, I still do, but letters from family saying, mom died um, a month ago and I want five gone from my sight. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you know, you need something involving grief, um, not gone from my sight. I have since learned that it actually is helpful after the death reading gone from my sight because they see the process and they see, oh, nothing bad happened here. Dad did exactly what this book says. Nothing pathological happened. This was normal. This is how people die. So it does help with their grieving and the guilt. But as a result of all this asking, I wrote uh, a booklet on grief. And it's normal grieving. I don't get to, into any of the pathology of grieving. It's all normal grieving. And um, a lot of agencies use it as their sympathy card. Um, have someone in the office sign it from the staff, mail it to the family, and it gives them guidance and support and you've personalized it, okay? So now, oh, I have, I and I don't have a thing. I have a DVD called New Rules for End of Life Care. Uh, it's 25 minutes. In fact, I was, I think I was going to show it when, when I was scheduled on coming. So I'll bring it next year when I come and we'll, we'll look at it. It's a great community education tool. And right now, uh, we're so immersed in this pandemic that we can't really think beyond into normal um, community education. Although it's a great tool, it really is. And so uh, if you haven't seen it, go to my website, there's trailers, there's all kinds of stuff on, on the website. All right, let me see what I've got here. Okay, we're reinforcing our teaching, it's key. We, it isn't enough to just verbally teach. We have to reinforce it and that's where the reading, that's where the booklets, that's where DVDs come in, okay? I think, I'm going to, oh, I have your list of questions. I'm looking at the time. Okay. Uh, I've got your list of, of questions. I wrote myself a note. I'm going to say this and then we'll open it up. How's that? Is that okay? Um, I think because of this pandemic, our lives are not ever going to go back to where they were. We're going to make adjustments. It's going to be years. Um, have to have the vaccine, everyone. Um, so we're, we're talking years. So we in healthcare, oh, there's, <laughs> someone, 
Joey, daughter Joey, bless her heart. She just, oh, I thought it was the cat. Um, <laughs> here, Joey just st stuck these in the door. Here's new rules. This is the DVD. Here's what my friend I care looks like. Um, that is so funny. Okay, you guys, I have this incredible team. My family works for me, all of them. Julia, daughter-in-law, daughter, nah, in my heart, daughter, daughter. Joey, when you call and place an order, um, that's Joey. Jackie does the website. So when you go to the website and you see all that, she's put that together. It's a whole family operation. And she just snuck in through this door on the floor to give me those two. Bless her heart. Okay. Um, so my note is, and I touched on it when we started, but I'm going to go back to it because so much of our work evolves around neutralizing the fear that families are bringing to the bedside. And remember, most of our work is with the family, um, not really with the patient because we don't get them soon enough. All right. So we want to develop a trust and a bonding right off the bat. And we used to do that with touch and sitting close and all these not having something between us. There were all kinds of tools that we used that we can't use now because of distancing. So I think that by Zooming, you start off with by addressing the elephant in the room and say, you know, times are different. And I want to be your support person. I want to be your friend. And we're going to do it safely. And to do that, most of our work is going to be just like this, back and forth on Zoom. But I won't lie to you. I promise you, I will tell you the truth. I will answer anything you ask. And we're going to have a lot of, of touching through this medium. I will be in your life more than I would be if I was coming to your home. I'm going to call you and touch base with you every day just to see how you're doing because you're there alone with your loved one and that can be scary. And you've got my number and you can call me anytime, day or night, but I'm going to touch in with you just to see how you are. This is the kind of way that now we have to develop that closeness. And that's by being open and sincere and do it in spite of the computer screen. That, that's so important. All right, do we want, do we want to open this? I'm looking at the clock. Do we want to open this up for questions or do you want me to address the questions you've given me first? What do you want to do? Jessica, you call the shot. All right, well, we actually have a question. If you could circle back and touch on the volunteer aspect that you mentioned earlier. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. I get, I get on automatic pilot and then I forget. Um, I think we're in a unique position where we as agencies can utilize our volunteers even more than we have. Um, bereavement is one way. And I'll talk about that. And the other way is with our families. I think maybe you don't even, you know, our policy is generally to say we've got volunteers and we'd sure like to, to um, hook you up with a volunteer and here's what they do um, and do you want one? I think you say, 
part of our program and how we're adjusting to social distancing is you're going to have a volunteer and she or he is going to make contact with you every day. They're just going to touch in on the phone. Um, you have to remember a lot of, of your families are going to be seniors who have as much trouble with Zoom as I do. And so some, a lot of the time, just a phone call is a lot less stressful than um, setting up a Zoom. And so you want to take that into consideration because as a social worker, an, an RN, um, a chaplain, you want the Zoom, you want the eye contact, you want the face. With a volunteer, you, you don't have to have that. Volunteer can call every day. I'm going to call you every day, right around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and I'm just going to touch base see how you are you know it's really hard when you're there all by yourself sheltering in place and um we're going to become friends and so uh you're going to hear from me every day just just to see how things are going so you assign a volunteer to make that daily contact part of what we're dealing with aside from all the fear of being alone in my house with my husband in bed dying, and I don't know what that's gonna be like except from television and the movies, and I can't have my kids come in, I can't have my neighbor, I can't have my minister, you know, I'm here alone. So you're gonna fill some of that void with a phone call with um, your, Maybe the depending upon where they are. If if that patient is days, then that nurse is going to call every day. If we're talking weeks, then maybe the nurse will call a couple of times a week, and the social worker will call once, and the chaplain will call once. You want to make sure that there a day doesn't go by that that caregiver hasn't had some contact from you as a hospice because they're so alone and the world becomes weird it becomes really strange and then you add that oh my god my husband's gonna die and i don't know what it's gonna be like so um bereavement volunteer so that's that's pre-death use of volunteers that we don't normally use them that way and i think you do the same thing with after the death hopefully it's the same volunteer that continues to be the support person who calls every day because now their loved one's dead and they're in the home alone for hours and hours and hours and they relive what's happened and they need constant touching in and reassurance so volunteer assigned calls every day the nurse can call that was the primary care nurse once twice maybe once the first week call again the second week the social worker calls a couple of times that first week. What's happening? What are you thinking? And then if they were related to the chaplain and chaplains, I really see the need and it's really hard for you to, to get into these families in a lot of cases because we're, we're so um, tied into specific religions and people don't understand that chaplains are eclectic, you know, that they're not zooming in uh, on a specific religion, but that are trained in incredible support, have incredible support tools that um, 
we need to be utilizing. So I would encourage a chaplain calling um, and getting a feel for how the family responds to that. But every day the volunteer calls. And then gradually, as you're seeing how things are going and life starts, uh, it's not gonna get back to normal, but starts opening up, then you can determine um, where you're gonna go from there with your bereavement follow-up. Send my friend I care, talk about it. The nurse or the social worker can say, you know, we sent you this booklet. What'd you think about that? You know, oh, look on page, blah, blah, blah. Look what that says. Are you feeling that? Do you see, have you experienced that? Because the isolation is just a million times more now during this pandemic than it is during normal grief. And uh, normal grief is isolating. Um, so it's just compounded. Okay, thank you for reminding me. Questions? Why don't we start with answering the first question on that list I already sent you while we get some people chiming in and then I'll, I'll jump in when you're done with that first one. Okay, can you comment on your view of the value of an interdisciplinary team, chaplain, social worker, CNA, nursing, in relation to providing care at end of life for families and patients? How do you see this approach as being beneficial? The wonderful uniqueness of hospice care for end of life is the team, is that it isn't just one person who is supporting the family. It isn't just one person's perspective on how to care for this patient and the family. It's a team and team is sharing ideas based on the unique and individual situation that each patient and family presents. It's the coming together of many minds M-I-N-D-S, minds on how to provide the most comprehensive and best care uh, possible. Each individual discipline is an expert in their individual discipline, but that's not enough for end of life care because dying, you know, end of life care is not just a physical experience. It's a mental, emotional, and spiritual experience. Just because you can't heal the physical body doesn't mean that there isn't healing to be done. We heal the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual parts of a person. That's part of our work. And that requires a team of experts, and that's what we've got. Okay, should I go to the next one? Yeah, we still don't have any questions in, so if anybody out there has a question, please raise your hand or type it into the question box and we'll make sure to get to you. Okay. How do you balance caring for and supporting a dying patient with the emotional ups and downs they may be experiencing? How much do you think emotional issues can inhibit care and what can be done to better support? Had a little trouble with that question, to be quite honest, because emotional support is a huge part of our work. That's huge in what we do. And yes, the patient and the family, they're gonna be a mess, but we're the experts. We're the ones that rise above their emotional mess and 
guide and support them. In a minute, I think you're going to see, nope, he left. You were just about to see a black cat tail. Okay. Um, our, our job is to, prov to rise above the emotional stress conflict that goes on among families, um, the fear that the family and the patient are bringing to this situation, all of that's normal. We know that all of that is normal. We know that a family crisis will either bring out the very, very best of that family, or it's going to bring out the absolute worst in that family. And our job is not to get caught up in either of that. We're, we're the conductor of the family orchestra. We're not in there um, with our agenda or our feelings or our interpretations. We are there to guide them so that they have a sacred experience in the death, dying and death of their loved ones. And no, we know there's going to be conflict. We know there's going to be emotions. Uh, and we're going to guide and steer that family. We know the patient's going to be scared. We know that the person who's dying's personality doesn't change. We know that they're going to deal with this dying last experience in the same way that they've dealt with any other challenge in their life. And we know that their personality doesn't change, it intensifies. So if they were ornery and cantankerous and living normal every day, they're going to be an absolute monster. And if they were easygoing, then they're going to be a little marshmallow. You know, we know that. We're the, we're the experts. We don't get caught up in it. We guide it. Okay? Um, I am interested to hear more about death awareness in the, uh, in the cognitively challenged. For instance, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, dementia. Huge, huge question. I don't know how much of an answer I'm going to have for that, except to say that we meet people where they are. I remember uh, a woman that with Downs, um, there was no way that she understood what was happening to her body or that death was approaching. And there wasn't really a purpose in making sure that she knew. You know, we loved her, we supported her, we changed dressings, but we didn't say, you know, you're not going to be fixed. Um, and death is coming. The same with dementia. I get a lot of questions about um, the caregiver died and how, how often do we tell mom that dad died and mom's got the dementia? Well, I think you tell her once. And if she responds and grieves, but if she says the next day, where's Bill? I don't think you say every day that Bill's dead and, and rekindle all that emotion. Um, I think we have to look at each individual situation, but I am certainly not one to say that we have to make sure everyone knows that death is around the corner for them. 
Now, that said, for us without mental or emotional challenges, I think we have the right to be told once that we can't be fixed. And hopefully that's our physician who is honest with us and saying, mm, we've given it our best shot. Um, but what we do with that knowledge is then up to us. And for us, sometimes denial is the only thing that'll get us through the night. Now, the other side of that is I hear a lot, don't tell grandma. You know, don't tell her the doctors can't fix her because we don't want her to give up hope. We don't, you know, we don't want her to know. Grandma lives inside of her body. We know, grandma knows. She may play the game with you and pretend she doesn't know. She knows. There comes a point where we all know. And that's another whole workshop. But um, I think I'm going back to everyone has the right to be told. And um, this don't tell grandma, you know, we know. We live inside of our bodies. I have a couple okay. of questions, Barbara. Great. Okay. So the first one is, we are living in a time where coming together in person isn't a possibility for many families after the death of a loved one. While Zoom memorials and gatherings are a possibility, for many, this can feel impersonal. Do you have any suggestions for grieving rituals that aren't necessarily Zoom related? Wow, okay, I haven't thought about that. The, my very favorite, if you want to call it that, exercise in regards to grief and grieving is I recommend to all grievers to, and I don't care if it was 20 years ago or 20 minutes ago, um, that you sit down and you write a letter. You put in this letter everything you've ever wanted to say, positive, negative, happy, sad, whatever is in your heart that you need to say to this person that died, you write it in a letter. And it may be volumes, it may be a little bitty couple sentences. It's whatever is in your heart and then you burn the letter and you throw those ashes out to the wind and know that that those thoughts will be received it's not enough to think them in your head you've got to literally sit down and write them channel those thoughts from your head down through your fingers into the pen there's something special about that rather than just sitting there thinking it. And that is a very helpful grief tool um, that can be used and particularly at this time. The, I'm gonna, can I jump into something that just popped into my head? And that is that I'm hearing a lot of, of people upset that they are not with their loved one at the moment of death and, and that dad had to die alone. And, you know, dad's in the ICU or dad's at home with mom in bed and I'm in my apartment because I can't come, whatever. Um, Number one, I, we, we don't understand how a person, what happens in the last minutes to hours before death. We think someone's talking, saying something profound, and then, you know, they're dead. Well, it doesn't work like that. You know, they are removed from their body. They're non-responsive. They've got their eyes partially open. They're breathing like a little fish. There's things they do that are normal. All right, so I explained to the family that 
in that dad's non-responsive. He doesn't, is not aware and doesn't care what's going on around and about him, all right? So your home and your apartment, sit down in your favorite chair, close your eyes, visualize in your mind, dad, in a bed, and, and in your mind, you want to go over to him, you want to hold him, you crawl in bed with him, hold his hand, whatever seems natural and normal for you to do in your mind. And then you talk to dad and you tell him everything that you've ever wanted to say to him. Remember dad when I was 12 and you took me out behind the garage and you beat the tar out of me? Shouldn't have done that. You know, that still hurts. And you talk about how much you love him and all the good things all in your head. And you stay there as long as you need to in your head. We're creatures of ritual and thoughts are things. And there is some comfort in that. It's not the same as being at the bedside. Um, but it helps a little bit. On that note, could you speak to how to support family members who live away and can't travel to visit the family because of COVID? Well, um, I would recommend that exercise that I just suggested um, is go there in your mind and uh, have a conversation in your mind. Um, and of course, home is great, but really, it's that's hard. I, there, there isn't any math. It's not. It's not all right. It's it's hard. And uh, we don't want it this way, but there really isn't anything we can do about it. And I don't have any magic tools um, that are going to make you feel better while you sit at home in your apartment and mom's in a nursing home dying or in the ICU or at home with dad. Um, so other than the contact, the phones, um, you know, I guess one of the things that I would do if I were in those shoes, I'd pull out the scrapbooks and I'd sit on the floor and I'd look at all my scrapbooks and I'd remember the wonderful life that we had and how much it meant and how special it was. Um, yeah, I'd probably do that. I think we can transition back to the list of questions while we wait for some more to come in. Okay. Um, well, we've already talked about how do I feel about social distancing and the telephone and how it's changed healthcare. Um, although I haven't said how it's changed healthcare, and I have a problem with that um, in that. If we're doing more and more teleconferencing before the pandemic occurred and now we're going to be doing it more and more and um i went with my husband not too long i guess it has been a long ago now months ago we went to the doctor's office and the um, pa came in and had her computer and she sat down with her computer like I'm doing with Zoom. And um, we sat uh, off to the side and she wrote, uh, read her questions and typed. And if she looked at us once or twice during this whole time, so impersonal. Um, doctor comes in, same thing. And that's not, what it does not instill confidence when you don't have eye contact. Now we're going to have eye contact in Zoom here if I had pictures of, of all of you out there. And when you contact your families, you're going to look up close and personal and look them in the eye. Um, 
but our medical um, in environment has changed from personal uh, to not just cl very clinical, but um, you have a different, you know, remember Mark, well, you probably don't. Marcus Welby, the family doctor, was there when you were born, was there, his son was probably there when, when you died. And we have a different physician every time we go into the doctor's office. Um, so that personal contact, they need to be teaching it in medical schools uh, and nursing schools. And I'm afraid that it's just going to get more and more clinical and less um, personal. And that's, that's sad for me because we're, we're fragile. We're fragile human beings. And we want reassurance. We carry all kinds of fear. You know, we want the, the loving father or the loving mother in the form of someone to pat us on the back and say, it's going to be okay, even when it's not. Um, and we're not getting that um, out of our healthcare system. And I think as human beings, that's a big, when we're scared, that's what we're looking for, is comfort and reassurance. I am really getting off schedule here or off topic, I'm sorry. Um, What are my concerns for hospice organizations during the pandemic? You guys are going to have to learn to think outside the box. You know, we're, we're so micromanaged by Medicare that we have forgotten how to think for ourselves. You know, we, we have all these rules and regulations and you have to do this and then we've, this pandemic, if nothing else, is making us think for ourselves, to think about our families and how can we best serve them and not have all that energy on how can I have great CAP scores. Um, let's see, we are grieving. Oh, I've already talked about self-care. Already did that. Um, well, this gets down to a couple of personal questions. We've got what, five minutes or so? What has helped sustain you over your tenure of doing hospice and grief work? I started in 1980. Um, and I got into this work because I thought death wasn't a bad thing sad, but that it wasn't bad. That was, I think what has sustained me in this work is my belief system that everybody dies, that dying is very, very sad, but it isn't bad. Um, and I have to say, I, in looking back over my life, it's all led me, every step of the way has led me here to what I'm doing and what I have been doing for the last, what, 40 some years. It's like, this is what I'm on the planet for. This is, is why I'm here, what, what my life's purpose has all been about. I can see how it all falls into place. And I think that's what has sustained me in all these years is just that, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I've got another question for you on my end. Sure. Do you have any advice for home care teams that are faced with patients who are alone? They have no consistent in-home support resulting in high stress on the team members. Are we talking home health? 
or are we talking hospice? Are we talking hospice? I think we're talking hospice. We're talking hospice. And they're in their home with no primary caregiver? Yes, I believe so. So how does that work? Because at some point, you got to have a primary caregiver or go into a facility. Um, and oftentimes, a hospice house, because, and I don't know if your hospice house takes private pay, but if it doesn't, then you're still, you're looking at what, seven to 10 days. And if, if uh, symptoms that I put that in quote, isn't managed, then you've got to find someplace else to go. Um, you can't really die alone. So um, I, I have had various patients over the years that have insisted that they could do this by themselves. Um, and, you know, at some point they can't. And so you need an alternative plan for when that time comes. Um, because when labor begins, you're so withdrawn from your body, you're in bed. And who's going to clean up the pee, the poop? Who's going to turn you? Um, you know, it, you, you can't. It's not like you're alive one minute and dead the next. So part of the social worker's job is to come up with a plan. We will help you stay in your home as long as possible but there's going to come a point where you won't be able to stay. What's our plan? Great. I think we have about time for one more question and I'll let you take the one from the list that you were going to speak to a moment ago. Oh, it was just, oh, let me see. It was the last one here. And I'm not sure I even know how to answer it. Would you be willing to share some of the self-searching questions you ask yourself? At bedtime, I will say to myself, what have I done that I've traded a day of my life for? At bedtime, I will go over my day and say, what, what was really good about today? Oh, I watched the, the three amigo squirrels at the feeder and brought a smile, you know, or I talked to the grandkids or I, what is it, emojied them uh, in a text. You know, before I go to sleep at night, it's kind of a look at the day, what did I do? Um, that is worth trading a day of my life for. Sometimes it's like, wow, no, you didn't really do anything. You wasted a whole day, never get it back. I think that that's part of my grounding, maybe. Family is huge for me, huge. Um, I'm so blessed that they're all here in town, they work for me. It's been hard to um, not have the family get togethers on Sunday, and, um, but that's also very grounding. I think that working with end of life gives you the opportunity to really look at your own life and see how do you wanna live it? Uh, because you recognize how precarious it is. Um, this certainly um, in the last few months has, has shaken our belief systems, our habits, how we view life. Hopefully it has given us the opportunity to look at relationships and what we're doing with our life. Do we like it? Do we want to change it? We always can. 
every day. You can change it. That's it. Barbara, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk with us. Um, we were going to look forward to next year and seeing you in person and asking you more questions. And um, we'll, we're really excited to have that to look forward to. I'll see you next year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bless you all. Jessica? Yes. I was going to suggest to Barbara that she shares her social media accounts. Oh, but I just can, if anybody I, wanted. Yeah, I can send all of that out um, okay. with, with the recording afterwards. Okay, sweetie. I'll talk to you later. All right. Thank you, Julia. See you later. Bye. Bye.